Get ready for the UWC On Air Power Hour, our weekly showdown of brain power and speed. As the episode kicks off, keep your eyes peeled for the electrifying Power Hour question. Answer it like a champ and you can score a fantastic UWC On Air hamper. But here's the twist. You must submit your answer within the hour after the episode ends. Ready to seize the spotlight? Welcome to another season of UWC On Air with me, Ganyezis Kakane. This is our second season of this groundbreaking adventure and at the heart of it, stories about real people, the movers and shakers who inspire and make an impact on our planet. Let's quickly take a look back at what's happened since the last season. Join in our new initiative, UWC Legacy Fund. The goal, 1 billion rand by 2060 when we hit a century. Giving generously will help fund future infrastructure projects. Together, we can create a legacy. Speaking of infrastructure, we've seen the university grow in leaps and bounds. First, Unibel residences for 2,700 students, then the futuristic education faculty building, and now, the Digital Innovation Hub, dishing out tech dreams like AI and VR. And the Center for Humanities Research, right in Woodstock on Great Moor Street, has also extended our footprint in the CBD. Sports? We rocked the rugby scene, clinching the Varsity Shield and prepping for Varsity Cup next year. As you can probably tell, it's been a busy time here on campus and we've got a lot more in store for you. Coming up in this episode... Rumored to be a home to a caracal and 558 species of flora and fauna, we explore UWC's Cape Flats Nature Reserve. Jerome Samuels tells us about his glow up from trolley boy to doctor of philosophy. We're traveling green. Take a ride with us on an e-bike. Electric vehicles are all the rage these days. They're more energy efficient than gasoline powered vehicles and produce far less pollution when in use. They do, however, have a limited range and need to be recharged, but recharging can take a bit of a long time. Thankfully, lithium ion batteries are just the answer. We chat to UWC's Energy Storage Innovation Lab Director, Professor Bernard Bladerhun for more. We are the only facility in Africa that can make lithium-ion battery cells. What we do is to, to develop new prototypes, right? So we make prototypes, um, anything that, that is needed in the country. Um, and one of the obvious choices was to build a, an uninterrupted power supply. We developed a, a UPS with a team of uh, engineers. So we, we have the, what we call a... An, unemployed graduate training program in the, the energy storage space. So we develop the new prototypes and once those prototypes are ready, when they actually function well and they have been tested, then we, we in, invite the, the TIVIT colleges to make those prototypes the center of their practicals. We make prototypes not just for the sake of making a prototype that looks, looks very interesting, it must be something that's actually usable in industry. And as we move through that process, we, we're already busy with other prototypes. We, we're busy building uh, bikes, for instance. We have measuring devices, uh, monitoring stations. Uh, all these things, they can actually be produced locally by, by artisans in the, in the country. It's the only facility on the African continent uh, that can produce cells at pilot scale, all right? For as much as this is quite exciting, it comes with a huge responsibility as well to be part of the community. And what I mean is to advance the community, produce product that will, you know, solve issues out there. The good thing with the e-trike, with the Aquila, is some of its specs, you get to 
easily reach 65 kilometers per hour. It got a 750 motor at the back, a 750 watt hour battery pack as well. I uh, supervise about uh, eight uh, electrical and mechanical engineer, uh, engineering graduates from all over South Africa. So we teach them about global warming and our global warming is a result of our current energy system and how it's releasing tons of carbon dioxide causing the Earth's Earth temperature to rise. And so those problems they become fully aware of. Problems like load shedding and how we can solve those problems. The mobile energy system is, uh, is catering us with energy when there isn't energy. So load shedding comes and we are unable to home our food. We are unable to boil the kettle and this UPS mobile system now allows us to power our Wi-Fi and we're still connecting with our people. We are able to make food and our children can eat. And this is this was the idea. So if you're tired of being left in the dark when it comes to energy matters, thanks to load shedding, you now know the folks at UWC are working on a solution. These innovative marvels promise to transform the landscape of transportation as we know it. The Cape Flats Nature Reserve is a private reserve which falls under the administration of the University of the Western Cape. First starting as a refuge for Strandfeld and coastal Feinbos, this 34 hectare private reserve now serves as a base for ecological teaching, environmental education and research, and is a natural space for the public to enjoy. We chat to Minilis Levendal, manager of the Cape Flats Nature Reserve Unit, to hear what it's all about. The Cape Flats Nature Reserve, it forms part of the Cape Floral Kingdom. In the world, we have six floral kingdoms. So the Cape Floral Kingdom is one of them. Although it's the smallest, it's the most diverse in terms of plant biodiversity and plant endemism. So it's very, very important and it's regarded, the Cape Floral Kingdom is regarded as one of the hottest hotspots in terms of um, plant biodiversity. So what is unique about our reserve is that it forms part of the Cape Floral Kingdom and like I said it's very diverse in plant species diversity so that is the more reason for us to look after what we have and to try to preserve it because it is very unique and it's recognized on a global level as one of the hottest hotspots in the world. were used and trained in ancient Egypt as hunting howls. Now, on our very own reserve, these enigmatic creatures stir up intrigue. From Asia to India, their dominion spans vast. And now, one of them might just prowl on campus. It does exist. <laughs> It wandered in um, in 2015. It wasn't introduced. So they have extremely large territories. And he was just passing by, decided, likes this one, it wasn't occupied yet, and he decided to settle and hasn't left. We have a 34 hectare nature reserve and it forms a tiny part of its territory. They can have up to anywhere between five and 48 square kilometers of territory. And this forms like 0.34 like square kilometers of that. So he moves between the reserve, between his other territories, and you have noticed the reserve is surrounded by a fence. It's no issue for him. Normal fences are like 1.8 meters. He can jump from a seating position three meters. So he's right over there, no problem. Being a nature reserve, it's completely natural. We don't feed anything. Um, you might have seen maybe a little water trough, but there's a camera trap there. So it's purely for the purpose of capturing what we see in the reserve. But no watering or feeding stations, so we don't do anything like that. They are completely reliant on the reserve. If it was not sustainable for them with enough food, they would actually leave and just find another area. In terms of tracking, we do not do that because only for research purposes would you put a collar on him 
Um, otherwise, it would be completely unethical. In terms of monitoring, he is regularly seen on our camera traps. So yes, he's still here. <laughs> he does disappear a part, um, part of the year. And that's when he goes out and looks for a female in other areas. So we know it's a male because there has been no kittens on the camera traps in all the years that it's been here. And the kittens will be with a female for up to a year. So anywhere from like around 10 months. And no kittens have been seen, no extra footprints have been seen. So we've established that it's a male. I would absolutely love to see him if I'm walking. But no, they are mostly nocturnal animals, extremely shy. So if he even suspects there's a person walking, he's going to be long gone. So the likelihood of you seeing a caracal, I mean, be very excited. <laughs> the security sees him because they're here at night. And that's where the, the rumors have started that the caracal is on campus as well. And he does walk about. The whole campus is his territory. Mm. <laughs> After the break, the veil of secrecy is lifted revealing the mystifying force that sets the pages of UWC's sizzling sports magazine, Blue and Gold. Welcome back. It's time to take a look at who sets the pages blue and gold turning. For those of you who don't know, Blue and Gold is UWC's official sports magazine. This publication was launched in October 2018, and we speak to UWC's marketing and media manager, Hassan Abada, on how it all began. <laughs> I arrived at UWC just over five years ago as the new media marketing and communications manager and there was a product, the UWC Sport Newsletter. It had great content um, and it was produced by my colleague Mulisi Kope. And all it needed was a little bit of projection, you know. I came from the most recent job I had was a magazine editorial executive so I had a good idea of magazine manufacturing and production and design. I gave New Lisi this brief and I said to him, I want this magazine to look like you can pick it up from a news agency and it looks like a sports magazine. Less of a pamphlet with the same content but more of a sport feel and the pictures need to jump out at me. And so Blue and Gold was born. I stole the name from Riverdale, which uh, is the Archie, Betty and Veronica characters. And their school newspaper was called the Blue and Gold because of the colors of their school. Now, as you know, UWC's colors of Blue and Gold, it tied in with the kind of apparel, uh, rugby team, football team, netball team that they all wear. And so it was, it was about popularizing a very important part of what we do at the university and one of the goals of the university and that is to have a, an excellent student experience. What I'm most proud about is that I was able to leave New Lucy on his own. The rest of the editions he came up with help from colleagues like Nastasha Crow, who's our tour, editorial assistant, um, designers in our team. They came up with all the, the goods themselves and I have minimal input these days except to talk about the synopsis that he comes up with and as the editor he makes sure that it comes out twice a year. Blue and Gold is one of the platforms 
where we showcase that the university really takes care of the student experience. Well, uh, it has been an honor to be part of Blue and Gold uh, magazine from the word go. When we started this as a newsletter, the, the, the process is pretty simple. We work as a team uh, at UWC. Uh, we work with our partner, which is the sports administration, uh, as well as other departments uh, across the campus to identify uh, which stories uh, that should go into that particular issue. And the team uh, kind of decides itself because you will find, for instance, in one, the, the, the women's sports are doing great, you will find uh, our alumni are doing great, etc. So it, it has been quite easy and it has been a, a privilege. This is a way more interactive publication. We meet the players, we see them, we can come down here to the stadium, speak to them, and when they know the magazine's in production, they'll see you around campus and they'll check in. They'll say, how's it going? And I'm an alum. And so I really like seeing our alumni do well. For me, this magazine is very personal. And then the way I treat each story then becomes a unique experience for each person we profile or each campaign that we are publicizing. Each magazine really is something that I put a lot of effort into. So the look and the feel, a lot goes into the planning of what each edition looks like. So even if you see the same players or the same coaches, there's always a different angle. There's always something new and fresh that we try to bring to each edition. So we, we came up with this idea of blue and gold. Uh, and I remember the very first edition, I still have it somewhere, it's vintage. It was a, a small edition. And at that time, where our women football had just lost one of the varsity football finals against TUT. And then after that, uh, when, when Hassan, our, our good supporter, saw the magazine, he said, no, you know what? I think we can do better. There's good potential here. Why don't we sit down, come up with a good quality magazine that will speak to what UWC stands for? And from there on, geez, we, it's been flying. It's been flying. And what has been the biggest achievement for me with this magazine was the demonstration of collaboration within the UWC departments. Because as much as this is a sport magazine, but it is produced by IA, and there are inputs from different people within campus. For me, that is what university should stand for, that collaboration. After the break, brace yourself for the world of UDABs, where style transcends boundaries. The University of the Western Cape has a bold history which started from humble beginnings. What was once described as a Bush University has grown into a forest of knowledge at the forefront of learning, teaching, research and innovation. You, our alumni, have seen the growth of the university from its old prefab buildings to its recent state-of-the-art science buildings and the new Faculty of Education. Growth and constant improvement does not stop here. We need to keep growing to meet the needs of the future. We have a goal to grow the university infrastructure for the future, to ensure UWC students are empowered with knowledge and skills for careers that don't exist today. We have a vision that UWC will be the home of new African knowledge. This vision requires resources. Those who have passed through these halls and walked these paths we ask you to join us to leave a legacy for the future. All we ask for is a small monthly donation to help us achieve our vision and grow the rich history of UWC. In 2060, UWC will celebrate its 100th anniversary. Let us leave something today to sustain the growth and existence of UWC. Alumni, students, staff, 
and anyone who can contribute. Let's make a small contribution today and grow the University of the Western Cape one brick at a time. Let's talk UWC Drift. We recently launched a range of campus wear called UWs. This campus wear really redefines the essence of campus chic. We speak to Director of Institutional Advancement, Professor Anish Singh, for more. This is not a unique uh, plan or a unique idea. I was driving in Stellenbosch a couple of months ago and I was following a car that had this bumper sticker that said Stellies. And I said, wow, this is actually quite a nice, cool looking brand. And why don't we do something like this at uh, UWC? And then I realized, you know, everybody uses the term UWs. The vice chancellor just spoke about UWs at graduation. We had a uh, graduate talking about UWs. And I said, why not make UWs our lifestyle brand, something that everybody feels proud of and they're happy to wear. And this is how UWs came about. Well, that has been an absolute challenge, trying to get the right price point because we don't want to overprice our garments. We took a number of suppliers' uh, products, we tested them, washed them. Some of them stretched beyond shape. Some of them were so much uh, smaller than when they went into the wash. So we had to do a lot of testing to get to the point where we now are confident that we have a quality of garment that we are happy to put out onto the market and at a price that is affordable. I'd like it to be much cheaper, but we don't want to compromise on quality as well. The UWC is committed to uh, empowerment and empowerment of females, and this is an excellent opportunity for us to get involved with the local business person, someone who's had a footprint at the University of the Western Cape, also worked at the university at one stage, and now is a successful entrepreneur. So we felt that this was the ideal partnership to be able to source local and more importantly is to empower the communities within which we operate. We've heard all sorts of terms and uh, yes, we were called a Bush College, but uh, I don't see UWC as a Bush College. I actually think that we have evolved into a forest of knowledge and that's what nobody wants to see. And this is why we are trying to get the brand out to be able to own our space to show that we are more than just a Bush College, that we have evolved, we have grown, and we are a global partner that is making a difference globally and locally. Be the envy of all of your friends in this campus wear that will be sure to turn heads. Get yours now. In this week's segment of Them and Now, we sit down with recent PhD graduate Jerome Samuels. From being a trolley boy at OK Bazaars to obtaining his PhD, his journey is one that defies all norms and expectations and leaves us in awe. I grew up in a place called, um, in an old park called the Valley of Plenty. And at the time I didn't understand why the Valley of Plenty, but the sand, there was sand in the Valley of Plenty and literally it was burnt black. And, but it was an area where um, during the day at night, there was a lot of gangsterism in the area. And, and as a child you grow up and you become used to these things happening. I had a brother at the time, um, Andrew and, and he was involved with, with gangsterism and because of that he, his involvement with gangsterism also affected our family because with the gangs if they can't get to you they get to your family and um, I grew up and I was at school I attended Parkfields Primary in Hanover Park and then I attended Crystal High in Hanover Park but when I was in grade 11 which was at that time standard 9 uh, I had a close buddy of mine, 
Nou, ons het altijd een spreekwoord gehad, dat hulle gesê het, hulle het altijd gesê, het is slim skittig en die saam skittig, het is noote skittig en is jou afskit. Thuis in Nouwe Park sê, dit is een monology. <laughs> so, so I had a friend, this friend of mine, Jeff, and we always used to be together. We've been doing things together, we've play, played um, sports together, we've played rugby together, and he was a close buddy of mine. And at the time, um, we were in an overpark, we've got these courts, and within the court you have three flights of stairs, staircases, and we were standing on the top one, and we were chatting with each other, and something happened where uh, Jeff saw his sister and the sister's boyfriend had an argument. And then he ran down and then he wanted to investigate what is happening. And as he went down, the, an argument um, started where uh, this boyfriend took the knife and he stabbed my friend, uh, Jeff. I ran down the stairs, stabbed him twice um, in his chest. And at that time, Jeff died. And when he died, it felt for me, everything is just coming to an end because um, we've been doing things together. And, and when that happened, I decided to leave school. I was, at that time, I was in standard nine, grade 11, and I left school. And then I decided I'm gonna start doing a trolley boy. And being a trolley boy, I used to push the trolleys and then people would give you money, obviously if you take the groceries um, to their car and sometimes you had to walk with people to their homes and you bring the trolley back and those were humble beginnings and from there i got a, a promotional job as a, a taxi um, they call it now a sliding door operator but the taxi guard <laughs> i applied as postmore prison as a correctional official at the time now you need to understand today you need to have matric in order to come in at correctional services. At that time, I only had a standard nine certificate and uh, they accepted me. And when they accepted me, they said, we're gonna give you a year to do your matric. And um, when you do your matric, then obviously you can stay on. I always have a passion of working with people. And that's why I've decided to go into social development and I've done my master's at the Institute for Social Development at UWC. And um, when I finished my master's, I came across um, this prof, Prof Nicola Roman, a wonderful person that, um, have, that inspired me throughout my journey. There were times, and one of the things that I always recall that prof always says is, uh, Jerome, life happens. And because life happens, things are not always gonna go your way. And, and there are times I had to face numerous challenges uh, when I started with um, studying my PhD. And then I, this year in April 2023, I completed the PhD in Child and Family Studies. And my topic dealt with the, now normally, even the first time that I met Prof. Roman, she asked, what is it that you want to study? I said, recidivism. She said, what is that? <laughs> And the term recidivism is repeat offending. So I always wanted to look for, because I work for the Department of Correctional Services, I always wanted to look into uh, why is it that people keep on coming back to prison. So in my master's degree, I've looked at the challenges that offenders face upon the release that leads to recidivism. So I looked at what are the causes, the multicausation causes that, keep on, that people keep on coming back to prison. And with my PhD, I've, I know that we don't have policy on recidivism. So I develop guidelines to manage recidivism in South Africa. I recall there were difficult times um, within an park at the time. He, my dad used to come home and maybe at night he would put us out. And, um, and those are challenges that have shaped me who I am today. Um, Having grown up in an overpark, I recall my, I, I used to have one pair of shoes and then there were time um, in winter where there would be a hole underneath the shoe and I would take a cardboard and put a piece of cardboard in. When I get home, my sock would be wet. But um, if I look back the journey that I've traveled today, I'm part of an organization called Machuali and Dreamspire, 
where we give back to children. And I think over the last few years, I was most probably through these organizations, we were able to give thousands pair of, of school shoes to other children. And it meant a lot for me because um, I always say, I know what it is to have, but I also know what it is not to have. Um, and those are the things that have shaped me into who I am today. Today, I'm a Deputy Director, Area Coordinated Development and Care, where I manage psychologists, social workers, nurses, doctors, and these people, and it would not have been possible if I didn't make the right choices in life. So my encouragement to the youth out there, when you have an opportunity, seize the moment and don't allow your circumstances to change your attitude. That concludes another riveting chapter of UWC On Air. Join us next week for more exciting stories and spellbounding tales. Did you spot our Power Hour question during the episode? If you've got the inside scoop, send your answer to onair at uwc.ac.za. Remember to follow and stay glued to our social media pages to see if you're one of our lucky winners.